Robert Eisler, The Messiah, Jesus, and John the Baptist. That was written in the 1920s. But uh, that is the, for his time and place, is so much original uh, research went into that book, even though it's not necessarily widely respected among you know, conventional scholars. He wrote that before the scrolls were discovered. He went into concentration camps in the Second World War. He came out in '47, his health broken, and um, he died around the time the scrolls were found. But if he had had the scrolls to work with, he could have gone as far further than I have gone. Easily, he was this fellow was pretty much of a genius. What he tried to do was to reconstruct the original testimonies about Jesus and John the Baptist in Josephus' work, not the overwritten, that's where I get all my ideas about overwriting from him, not the overwritten, um, reworked version that presently exists in Josephus. And so uh, by going back and, and, and examining the contemporary sources and so on and, and, and doing an incredibly good job at that, he, um, I don't think his reconstruction necessarily is convincing, but the process that he went through to me was really an impressive process and the knowledge that he had and the wide-rangingness of of, of, of of where he went was really an impressive thing. So um, he was working on the um, on the testimonies in Josephus and then went back to see if he could figure out what Jesus had really said. The John the Baptist uh, testimony I think is pretty authentic, but the Jesus testimony has been um, transformed by later copyists. Everyone agrees with that. It's what's called a um, Interpolation. So uh, that really is not um, uh, reliable or um, authentic, but he felt there was something said at that point. I'm not sure or not sure that there was or there wasn't, uh, but something, you know, something has been written in that wasn't there in the original Josephus. And, and he, he assumes that the, the, the reference would have been negative in the original Josephus because Josephus didn't like the people he refers to repeatedly as um, miracle workers, pseudo-prophets, Josephus was never known as anyone being a real prophet, pseudo-prophets, uh, imposters, and particularly in the period from the 40s to the 60s before the war against Rome, his um, complaints against these people mount to uh, crescendo, he's so uh, aggressively against them. And he says that uh, these innovators into the religion of the ancestors were more harmful even than the bandit. Bandit is another word for violent revolutionaries. The bandit thugs with whom they cooperated. And what they were trying to do, according to him, in two separate testimonies, one in the war and one in the antiquity, lead the people out into the wilderness, there to show them the signs of their impending freedom in one case, he says, uh, in the other book he says redemption. So these miracle workers and imposters and pseudo-prophets who were in, in, um, in effect more dangerous even than the, uh, than the uh, people he calls the bandits and the uh, party uh, insurgents people uh, were trying to lead the people out into the wilderness and show them the signs. Well, that's how Jesus is portrayed in the Gospels. Jesus is certainly portrayed, whether he was or wasn't, I don't know. But this is what we're doing, this talk with Jesus. Jesus is certainly portrayed as someone who what? Goes out into the wilderness with the 5,000 or the 4,000 and shows the signs. But according to the Gospels, what are the signs? And even the Gospel of John, uh, constantly goes on about the signs Jesus is doing, for instance, um, and these are the signs which the Lord did in Cana of Galilee. And at one point he says, turning water into wine. Uh, in John, I think at the marriage, uh, we'll look at those passages. But in the synoptic, on the, based on the same source, but it isn't so clear cut as this. The three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are largely synoptic, but they sometimes overlap with John as opposed to the other two, which is really weird, particularly Mark, but even sometimes Luke.
So it's a very complicated process. Of, uh, they, for a long time, several decades back, people were trying to determine which gospel came first. And most of the scholarly works are dominated by, um, you know, um, attempts and questions and analyses of that kind. And then there was form criticism and uh, redaction criticism. Uh, so there were all these attempts to reconstruct what was a reliable tradition, what wasn't a reliable tradition on the basis of these uh, kinds of um, approaches. And I'm, I'm not an expert on these approaches, frankly. And other people can tell you about them, form, redaction, criticism, and so on. But um, one of the things that was uh, very, uh, very much to the fore was to try to determine which gospel was first. Mark or Matthew, the traditional view is that Mark is first. And then a lot of, picked up in Claremont, they got all involved in this thing called Q. You know, Q, uh, which is a German word, quellen, which means source. The excellent material, I guess, in Matthew and Luke that didn't exist in Mark was called Q. As if all this could be, you know, uh, developed into some final uh, format for how the Gospels uh, were put together and developed. My view is that the interrelations between the Gospels are far more complicated than that. They seem to bounce back and forth with different overlays. It's not sure at what point they even reach the final form that we have them. John is supposedly there are some copy of John, I think, found either in scrap piles in Egypt or in the Sinai or someplace that's supposed to date from around 120. That could, could be. But um, if you look at a person called Justin Martyr, an early Christian theologian from the second century who was by according to his name, Martyr. He's uh, mid uh, 100s someplace. Uh, and he, he's from Asia Minor someplace. Uh, Justin Martyr, he writes a thing called, I think, uh, Dialogue with Trifo, I think it is. Anyway, he's attacking this Jewish rabbi figure that he has met in Asia Minor, and they're arguing over different things. He doesn't have the Gospels in the form we have them, and this is the mid to the mid second century, and he's a theologian. Well, this is a single document called the Memoirs of the Apostles, but it's not the, the, the Gospels. Of, uh, it has some of the things in it, of course, that we're familiar with. But it doesn't have uh, any uh, actual structure of the form that we're familiar with. So how come in the mid 100s, does someone who's supposed to be, uh, uh, you know, in the forefront of Christian theology, how come he doesn't know the gospels that we that we have? And I don't even think he shows any indication of knowing John at all. I'm not. I mean, I'm not saying that that doesn't say that John wasn't floating around somewhere. But he doesn't seem to know it. And he doesn't even know the Gospels. He doesn't call them Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So that, to me, is the earliest testimony that I can find of anyone talking about the Gospels who should know something about them and doesn't. But uh, read his writing and then catalog what he's got there. And I think you're well on your way to a first step of what was circulating around the year 150. Uh, but uh, certainly, um, it wasn't even at the Council of Nicaea in 325. They were, they were just debating these things. I think it was not till the end of the 300s that the final form of what we now know as the four Gospels were in their form. That doesn't mean they weren't circulating earlier in different forms. But there's also lots of apocryphal Gospels circulating early. As we know, you know, the Gospel of Judas was circulating uh, quite early, in the 200s anyway. Late 100s, anyway, because um, Irenaeus in, uh, in in Lyon in France condemns it, and maybe it's one of the reasons it disappeared. Who knows? But certainly, different things were circulating in the East than in the West. Certain different. I mean, look at a scar like Irenaeus in France, what we now call France Gaul. I can assure you, he knew nothing about the historical Jesus at all. He just condemned and accepted what he found attractive and unattractive. It wasn't something that was based on any historical perception. 
he was a very uh, you know, aggressive personality, as many of the early church fathers were. The eastern ones are less uh, aggressive, the western ones. Eusebius came from the east, but he went west uh, with Constantine, and he's, as I said, is particularly aggressive. He, he organized the Council of Nicaea for Constantine. He brought basically brought Constantine into the church. He was Eastern, though, in the sense he came from Palestine, Caesarea. He had, as I said, no love or charity in him whatsoever. If you are recommending and um, advocating charity and peacefulness and so on, then it seems to me you should be somewhat of a charitable individual yourself, uh, which uh, bears on what we're talking about in vis vis people like you see. He was asking me, how did Jesus get these unique ideas? Now, we all know that some of these ideas are what are associated with quote, Jesus. But these are not new ideas. They're only new in Palestine. These are not new ideas in the Greco-Roman sphere of large. That's what makes me suspect the historical presentation of the Jesus in Palestine. We're talking about a figure calling Jesus, which oddly enough, in Hebrew, is supposed to come from the word Joshua, or Yehoshua, or Yeshua, which actually means what in Hebrew? Savior. Yehoshua is he who saves his people. <laughs> the Savior. So his name, in, in, transliterated into Greek, from Hebrew, this is a short name. Yeshua was short name from Yehoshua. The consonant in Hebrew is Yod. There's no J consonant in Hebrew. So it's a Y. It's a Y that goes into Greek and then Latin as. I think Greek, it still keeps the Y form. For instance, Jacob, I think, in Greek is, is still a Yaakov, I think so. It only becomes Jacob as it goes into Latin. You should try to know a little uh, uh, Hebrew. And it's usually found at the beginning of words like this, and it usually has to mean something like he who, John. Yochanan is he who comforts. You know, the Hebrew uh, official name for God is YHWH. You all know that? Anyone doesn't know that in this class? And then, so they tried to fill that in modern-wise, and they get Yahweh. This is a root in Hebrew. And Hebrew is based on three-letter roots. So we're, so we're all Semitic languages, Arabic too. Now in Hebrew, Yehovah, which is a total misnomer, based on the three-letter root and the, and the he form. God said to Moses, well, if you look at the Hebrew, he says, my name is Ahweh. Not Yahweh, but Ahweh. I am who am. Ah is first person. Yah is third person. When God is speaking, it's Ahweh, showing you it is a verb. A verbal noun, actually. When you're speaking about him, it's Yahweh. Or Yahweh, or whatever. It actually means, again, a fourth form causative, because we don't have the causative form in English as they have in Arabic and Hebrew. It means he who causes to be. Because HWH means to be, and the form of the word means to cause to be. So he's the critic. And you see this got all mixed up in. Uh, when the Bible was translated into English at the time of the Elizabethan period and so on, see, the Hebrews knew that they didn't pronounce that word. Why? It was the forbidden name of God. Only the high priest pronounced the word when. At Yom Kippur, when the high priest went into the temple and pronounced the forbidden name of God. Now, he must have known how to pronounce it, otherwise he couldn't have pronounced it. The one thing was clear. What the Jews put on their here were diacritical marks, not for the word Yahweh, since they knew they weren't to say Yahweh. They put the diacritical marks for the word Adonai. What does Adonai mean? My Lord. So they took these vowels, E, O, A, and stuck them under these things here, and you come out with Yehovah. When the Protestant translators saw it, which was, you know, Jehovah. But it's not sounding in English, but it just isn't Hebrew, and it isn't what they were saying. It's actually, uh, they didn't realize that Jews just said Adonai, which means my Lord. 
and they put those markings in under there so that they would remind themselves not to pronounce the word but to say Adonai. So that, that was a mistake that crept into the English uh, lexicon. I don't think Yahweh is any better. I think Yahoo may have been how they pronounced the, the name of God, Jeremiah, Yeremiah. What a given scholar like myself has to say, it could um, be important for five years, and then five years later another group of scholars comes along, and they have to make their name. So for instance, what someone said in 1940, in case when there's a great scholar that everyone refers back to, okay, it's sort of like a, almost a primary source. But normally speaking, scholars, there are waves of scholars. And each new wave sort of revises or changes or moves along from the previous wave. And in this subject, it's an endless process. Plus, the literature in this subject is vast. I'm talking about secondary literature. You could spend your whole life uh, investigating. And this field has, the historical Jesus field has a huge secondary literature. Sources, literature. Would primary literature be like Josephus? Yeah, exactly. Primary literature is normally eyewitness sources. That's why you could have a tertiary literature here, because church fathers, you know, who are much after the uh, event and are already talking uh, about these things, as if it's you know something they're looking at themselves. Eusebius, for instance, is culling his sources. So I mean, you wouldn't necessarily, you know be restricted just to levels of sources, primary and secondary, but normally we bunch uh, the church fathers under primary sources. Yeah? I would consider Paul primary. Oh, father. absolutely. These are unofficial distinctions anyway, but I'm saying we have, uh, secondary sources are like scholars today, you know, that's what we normally call secondary scholars. That's what I was getting at. I mean, there's a vast literature. You're going to call that tertiary literature? I mean, that we're getting really splitting hairs here. Usually we just call that all secondary literature. And so therefore, you've got to bump the church fathers up to primary, a primary source. I was saying all reasonable people uh, feel that Paul's writings came before the Gospels, and which makes Paul doubly primary to the Gospels, chronologically. And if there's any dependency in the Gospels on Paul's writings, which is something I want to discuss in this class and have been trying to lay the groundwork to point out to you when we go through the Gospels, which is why, theoretically, a class like this should read Paul's letters completely. Because how can you decide if there's any influence of Paul's letters on the Gospels if you have never read Paul's letters? Can you make a judge on that? No. You have to read Paul's letters extremely carefully. Romans 1 and 2 Corinthians and Galatians. These are the bedrock of Paul's approach. If you want to really get at Paul for this purpose, read those three things. So what about Titus, uh, Timothy? There's nothing in those letters that is anything new beyond what you're going to get in Paul. So well, aren't those Pauline letters? No, scholars don't think they're pastorals as they're called. Some of the other letters are not considered to be written by Paul himself, but by a Pauline writer. And then there are letters like Ephesians, which are up in people don't know. Philippians, I think Paul did write. And it's quite an interesting letter, but it, as I said, it doesn't really add anything new. Hebrews, people definitely know, is not written by Paul, but someone in the Pauline school of thought, thought. So that's really way in another world, but very interesting letter, very interesting letter, but it's not going to help with the historical Jesus question, to any extent that I can see. Um, anyone else have a letter in mind that they want a judgment on? So there are letters that scholars put in the middle questionable category, which would be all the pastorals that are more or less thought to be Paul line, but not written by Paul himself. Thessalonians, I think they think is written by Paul. Whether both are, I'm not sure, but I think they probably both are. Peter's letters, most don't think they're written by Peter. Uh, John, I don't think, which John? There's so many Johns, uh, it's hard to say which John may or may not have written those. So again, is it the same as the author of the Apocalypse? Or 
the Apostle John or, or you know, John of Ephesus. There's so many Johns. So that's a whole other question. So I can't even tell, tell you what. James. Uh, it's a, a very difficult to decide if that was written actually by James or someone in the Jamesian school. But for sure it's supposed to be James the brother of Jesus. Not James the brother of John. For sure James is supposed to be James the brother of Jesus. And Jude is supposed to be Jude the brother of James. Which therefore makes him Jude the so-called second brother of Jesus. So again, and Jude is very sort of just a short little sketch. So it's so um, opaque, it's almost hard to, uh, <laughs> to pull anything out of Jude. But the main thing in Jude is the way he announced himself, Jude, the brother of James. Do you know the letter of Jude? And also the fact that he refers to things like uh, Balaam, which are very important uh, allusions. And in addition, he speaks to the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with the myriads of his angels, which is also a very important allusion for our Jesus speaks of that. Uh, James was supposed to have spoken of that in his last um, appearance before the crowd in the Eusebius sources and so on. Let me just read you this from Jude, the brother of James, line 14. And Enoch, the seventh from Adam, also foretold all of these, saying, now he, he ascribes this to Enoch, some book of Enoch that we maybe not haven't seen. I'm not sure it's in the present book of Enoch that we're familiar with. Behold, the Lord comes with the myriads of his holy ones to execute judgment against all and to convict all the ones who are ungodly among them regarding all their works of ungodliness which they did in an ungodly manner and regarding all the hard things which ungodly sinners spoke against him. That's in the Dead Sea War Scroll. The coming of the Lord with his myriads of holy ones uh, to execute judgment like rain on the just and the unjust alike as Jesus is said to say it in uh, I think the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, in the war scroll, it's on all that grows. Uh, twice in the Dead Sea war scroll. So these are, uh, so the, sure, the Dead Sea scrolls are primary sources. I'm just talking about the primary sources in the New Testament to, uh, you know, Book of Acts, I don't think will help you too much. That's already a conglomerate book, which is so difficult to understand, it would take a half a, a, half a term for me to go through it with you. The last part of it is what we call the we document. It switches from what we call third person to first person. We is plural, I is singular. It's all very rational to think about it. What did we just read you the other day? That was in the first person, plural. The pseudo Clementine recognition was we went up to the Temple Mount, we saw our James do this, then we saw this. It was a report written supposedly by uh, Clement, um, a f seven yearly report written by Clement to uh, James as leader of the early church on uh, things that he'd been doing over the last seven years. So it, it, it is in the style of the we document in Acts, or vice versa, the we document in Acts is in the style of the pseudo Clementines. Because the whole of the pseudo Clementines are we. Either Peter or Clement reporting from travels abroad or travels to along the coast of Lebanon and uh, Asia Minor. So um, anyway, this we document in Acts, when does it intrude into the narrative? Does anyone know? Because the first part of the narrative is all he, he, they. After the so-called Jerusalem Council, when James sends down his rulings to overseas communities. And from then on, it, it sort of goes back and forth. Some of it is we, some of it is he, they. And it's like uh, two different manuscripts were spliced together uh, at some point by somebody. Here Paul breaks with Barnabas and Mark. And Paul says, I won't take this Mark with me on my travels anymore because he deserted our work in Pamphylia. If you know that passage, then it's going to be in document 16.10. And it changes tone. All the miraculous material drops out. 
you know, all of these sort of uh, supernatural things, and it just becomes a prosaic, we went here, we did this, we went here, we did this. Then Paul's arrest and uh, some really interesting material about interviews, five chapters of interviews with the uh, Roman governors and uh, Herodian kings and queens with whom he's on extremely intimate and congenial terms. They seem to like him and they, he gets along with them and he talks to them regularly and they have a very good time with each other. To me that's very uh, illustrative because I can't think of the historical Jesus sitting on good terms with the uh, Roman governor and the, uh, and the Herodian kings. You know, the historical Jesus at the very least seems to uh, been very uh, leery and uh, kept his mouth closed in, in their presence and didn't have a, wasn't all chatting with them the way Paul is. And uh, which shows me the difference between Paul and Jesus right off in terms of figures and in terms of approach and in terms of what he's up to and where, where he's after. So those uh, materials in the We document, which include the last confrontation with James in chapter 21, it's made very clear that. Again, James is the leader of the early church, and it's not the other James. That James is already gone. James, the brother of John, is supposedly departed way back in chapter 13 or so. Which I forget what chapter, but earlier. And this James is um, not introduced who he is, but it's clear that James is the one who makes his rulings and tells Paul what he can or cannot do. So once again, even the second part of Acts makes it clear that James is the leader of the early church. Now I know those who are church members would not like that, and therefore we have a problem right there the way a Muslim would react to what you say about their violence. You have to decide if that's a reasonable, a reasonable deduction from the church. And that's where the word reasonable comes in. So to go back to the original point, most reasonable people think the writings of Paul predate these other sources. The book of Acts is possibly primary in the we area, but secondary to Paul in the other areas. And then the Gospels are all considered secondary to Paul, but we want to go back before them. We came to the present situation. So we were talking about Jewish history down to the time of Alexander the Great came to the first Babylonian uh, captivity, and the first Babylonian captivity, if you recall, was uh, approximately 585 to 540 something or other, somewhere in there, B.C. That's the end of the southern kingdom of Judea. When did the northern kingdom end? Seven. Seven something, 722. And who put it, an end to it? The Assyrians, okay. So that left the Israel thing in question. Who were the Northerners after that? Were they just, as the New Testament sees them, Samaritans? Or uh, as the Southerners see the Samaritans, a mixed group of settlers and other persons who had come in there later and may be uh, authentic but may not be authentic. The Samaritans, even today, there are some Samaritans left, as I told you, see themselves as authentic and have their own Old Testament. How many books in the Samaritan Old Testament? To today, there's about 500 Samaritans left. Most of them live in Tel Aviv. But in any case, they're there. Some in Nablus. Why would they live in Nablus? Nablus is the Arabic for Neapolis. What's it the new city on top of? The destroyed city of the old Samaritan, or the old northern kingdom capital of Shetet. But that wasn't really the capital of Shechem. That was the city Jacob founded in the Old Testament, if you recall. Here's Palestine, okay. Yeah, Israel, whatever you want to call it. Jerusalem here. Uh, Bethel, which is this northern shrine here. Uh, Shechem here. And then north of Shechem was Samaria. Uh, the capital was moved to Samaria at one point in time. So the reason Samaritans are called Samaritans, Samaritans is after the capital Samaria, which was north of Shechem. They're all along the top of the hill spine. They're the defensive arrangement of these places. That's why they're all lined up like this. So Bethlehem here, and then down here is Hebron, David's city. 
So originally Judea was here, and Israel was here. When David took Jerusalem, he united the two. And they stayed together under until Solomon, and then they broke apart in the uh, after the death of Solomon into northern and southern. The southerners kept Jerusalem as their capital. So Jerusalem became the center of the focus of the Davidic monarchy ever after, and that's why it stays that way in the Gospels. Is that clear? Okay, so now we go down to 700s. The north it disappears, evaporates, and so on. In the 580s or so, a series of Babylonian incursions ends up finally with the destruction of the temple. What temple is that? The first temple, Solomonic temple. So how long did it go? Oh, from about 1000 to 585. 400 some odd years, I guess. Then there's interregnum. 540, the first returnees come back. How come the first returnees start coming back? It's in the book of Isaiah. Scholars divide Isaiah up into how many parts? Three parts usually, but the two, two main parts. It's a big conglomeration of stuff for about 30 chapters, 35 chapters, and then there's some historical material in there, which is overlaps from shown in the Book of Kings. If you look at it there very carefully, there's prophetical material which relates to the 700 B.C. period. Then suddenly there's historical material which has to do with Isaiah having arguments with King Hezekiah or somebody. You can look at myself. I think it's chapter 36 to 40. And then something new material comes, the material we all love, the material you always hear in the Hallelujah Chorus. What we hear in Comfort Ye My, Comfort Ye My People is the reinterpretation of that material in, after the Christian, that is after the Gospels begin to pick up Isaiah material and make a straight way in the wilderness attributing it to John the Baptist. Remember I told you that's also in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but it's not interpreted the same way as in the Gospels. Make a straight way in the wilderness and the Dead Sea Scrolls is make a straight way for the study of Torah. The point as Isaiah 43 sees him making is comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, your time of trial is done, make a straight way in the wilderness, wrap up the hills, for a path for the people to return from the captivity. That seems to be what Isaiah is saying in chapter 40, within the context of those historical events there. But that's reinterpreted to mean the coming of Jesus 500 years later. It's reinterpreted in the way we all are familiar with it in the music that we hear and so on. And you say, well, that's what it meant. No, no. That's a reinterpretation of the passage along with what later people thought it should or could or might or ought to have meant or what they wanted it to mean or how they used it. Even the scroll material doesn't mean that's what it meant. Follow me? So again, all this has to do with getting familiar with the sources. Anyway, Isaiah 40 is a new voice. And it goes to 66. And it's in the, instead of in the 700s, it's in the 500s. 200 years have elapsed. Now, the fundamentalist thinks that's the miracle of Isaiah, that he can think 200 years before, and that's all from the later period. But what do the scholars say? The scholars say, no, no, no. Someone tacked new material onto Isaiah who wanted to get the prestige of Isaiah and, and wanted it to be read under the name of Isaiah. The new material is the most beautiful material, but what most people miss is that what it is proclaiming it may not be Jesus Christ, the Messiah. It may be, and you'll have to decide that for yourself. What it certainly is talking about is the return of the Jewish people from captivity in Babylon. Not only is it, return, uh, is it talking about that, it seems to be the actual instrument involved in producing the return. Why is the instrument involved in producing the return? Because Isaiah at one point says, You, Cyrus, my Messiah, my anointed one, says Messiah, will accomplish my whole purpose. It has God saying that in this material. Are you following me? So who is Cyrus? This tells you the political situation. Persian king, and then it really greets him. The conqueror from the east is going to break down the prison walls. Uh, it loves Cyrus. And it greets him with tremendous flattery. And in return, it quotes Cyrus as saying, 
Okay, you Jewish people, I recognize you. And of the temple I say, let it be rebuilt. And it actually incorporates Cyrus's words to the Jews to go back to their own country and rebuild their temple to a certain extent in honor of him. Since their God is presented in Isaiah as having anticipated Cyrus's coming. So they said, yeah, hey Cyrus, our prophet 200 years ago, who we tacked this onto, but you don't know that. They predicted you, not only did they predict you, they called you by name. <laughs> and said you were going to come and do all these great things. And Cyrus said, oh, great. Did they do that? Well, your, your people are great. Go on back home and rebuild your temple. You know, and that's all in Isaiah. Most people only look for Jesus in Isaiah. No, no, don't just look for Jesus in Isaiah. Read Isaiah for what he's saying and see the two parts. Okay, I hope you, that will encourage you to read Isaiah. How many will that, what I just said, encourage them to take a look at Isaiah sometime for themselves? I hope it does. I hope it does. Isaiah is great. And probably the greatest literature ever written in my personal view. I believe Isaiah and Ezekiel, some of the Jewish prophets, are some of the greatest literature ever written. You know, in the introduction to the Jewish war, Josephus says some things that are extremely interesting. I don't mean the, the editor's introduction, I mean his own introduction. People don't realize how modern these writers were at that time. The reason we're bothering with Josephus so much is, first of all, the background it gives to the history, and we're doing history. But second of all, the fact that it could, it's one of the, um, impressions out there that has been for maybe a century or so that some of the writers of the New Testament were using Josephus or were dependent on Josephus. I think certainly the book of Acts is aware and is incorporating material from Josephus, particularly in the beginning parts. Doesn't seem to be using the war that we're looking at as much as the antiquity. There's material in the antiquities that seems to float into the book of Acts. I can show you that at some point. But since we've got the war in a cheap edition, when was the war written? Probably around 73 or 74, right after the war. I'll read you the introduction here and he'll tell you. So that's pretty dead on as far as events in Palestine go relating to Jesus. In other words, Jesus would have appeared if we can agree on the dates, and or if we think we have the dates right, perhaps 40 years before, or thereabouts. And the Antiquities was written, I think, 93 or 94. He died in 96? Well, we don't know. He disappears from the, uh, you know, seems to evaporate by 96. And uh, some people think he lived till 104 uh, A.D., not years. Uh, I think he says when he was born in his Vita, which is the autobiography, which is very interesting, uh, means life. I think he says he was born around 38 A.D. or something like that. He died in 96. But I don't think he died a natural death. Uh, I think he uh, was swept up in the suppressions that occurred under the Emperor Domitian. Well, I'll just keep on writing. This should be second nature to you, these people. We're going to study this period. Domitian. In fact, I think he was killed by a Christian. The, the, the rumor is that he was killed by one, interestingly enough, a slave called Stephen. Christian slave. In the book of Acts, you have the stoning of Stephen as the archetypical Gentile believer. Stephen is um, the person who um, Paul addresses as the first fruits of Achaia in the letter to the Corinthians. That doesn't mean it's the same Steve. Obviously, the case wouldn't gel there, but still, it's interesting uh, that that's a uh, 
Uh, where would you find this material? Uh, a lot of the material is in Suetonius and other Roman historians of this period called the Twelve Caesars. Really interesting reading because it's extremely, uh, it's extremely uh, raunchy. Suetonius uh, liked to appeal to his audience. Josephus is pretty raunchy when uh, he go, gets down to it. And people wanted to get an audience then, and so, um, the more lurid what they could uh, present in the writings, uh, uh, the more people were likely to uh, read it. So uh, Josephus wrote the uh, Antiquities around 93 or 94, and he wrote the Vita around that time too. And uh, I think, let me see if I get my dates here right. The mission was in the last stages and getting a little bit nasty by that time. Titus, I think, died in, uh, jeepers, I don't want to make any mistakes here. 70, 81, I think. I think he died in 79. He definitely dies or is assassinated in 96. Uh, this one definitely is assassinated in um, 68, I think. Uh, Claudius uh, died either. 54 or 56, I can't remember which, I think it's 56, assassinated. Caligula was assassinated in, um, I think, I think, uh, let me see, let me see, Tiberius would be, died around 37 or so, and he died around, I think, 41 or 44. I forget, you can check the back of my James book. Augustus died around 14 or so. Who did I say died naturally? Titus. Titus. Tiberius. Tiberius. Augustus. Vespasian. A lot of them were assassinated, uh, who were particularly uh, unpopular, but also popular. Uh, 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 Claudius was quite popular, I think. But Claudius had a lot of trouble with his women. He wasn't a very uh, handsome or attractive person. He got involved with some questionable wife types. I'm not even clear he liked being married, or he did. He turned his head. And um, he was an intellectual thought. He had hidden in the background. There's a great uh, public television thing done on Claudius, which gives you tremendous insight into this parent. It's I, Claudius. It's a biography from Claudius's point of view that he per per purposely made himself invisible at the court and thought he was an idiot so that uh, he could avoid these assassinations and poisonings that were going on in the wake of uh, Augustus's reign. Augustus's wife, Livia, was a little bit power mad. And he, Augustus, didn't have any children by her. She was uh, a later wife that he obviously became infatuated with, and she dominated him. And uh, she was very uh, power mad. So she eliminated all of the uh, actual offspring of Augustus by previous wives and um, through poisoning and things. And um, I think Claudius was one of those people who actually did, was a distant offspring of Augustus through a nephew or something like that. Popular nephew called Germanicus after some victories in Germany. Anyway, uh, I Claudius really does give you tremendous insight into this. And uh, he made believe that he was crazy and that he was stupid, that he was a simple fit, that he was a cripple and everything. He was a cripple, but so that they wouldn't consider him emperor material and they wouldn't bother assassinating him or poison. Uh, he, I think he was the either the uh, cousin or of Caligula. Audience. Yeah, or could have been his brother for that, I'm not sure. Uh, could have been his older brother, but anyway, he, he Caligula came through m much more, um, much sooner than Claudius, even though Claudius was older. But Cal Caligula was quite mad. He was assassinated for sure. And also Augustus's um, sister was pretty wild. And, uh, you know, there's some lesbian stuff in it, and uh, a 
a lot of that kind of stuff. Of course, the Romans they were into all that stuff. So, um, you know, sex every which way was the Roman diet. And uh, <laughs> that's just the way it went. And um, so um, everyone wanted to be in Caesar's bed, supposedly. And uh, according to everyone, all the gossip, Caesar had been in the bed of every woman in Rome, just about. And this is his downfall. That one of his jilted uh, women, who was very vengeful, that's how, that's the plot of this Rome series, was Brutus's mother. And Brutus actually, you know, if you read Julius Caesar of Shakespeare, it was one of the assassins, chief assassin of Caesar. But Caesar doted on him, and many said that he was an illegitimate son of Caesar. So part of the plot of that Rome is to show Brutus's mother taking vengeance for having been jilted by Caesar by putting it into her son's head over and over again to kill you know, the person who had done her wrong and so on and so forth. Now, um, Suetonius gives you the biographies of all these people. So it's really worth it. If you like ancient history, it's good to go to the sources. And um, Suetonius is a good source. Uh, what other Roman historians cover this period? There are really only two. Tacitus, who wrote two books, one called the Annals, and I think the other is called the Histories. The Annals go year by year. And all these people are um, writing more like around 100 AD. And then there is uh, someone that's running a little later, Dio Cassius. Those, he's usually called Dio. Those are the guys that you want the Roman histories to look at for the horse's mouth of what's going on from a Roman point of view in this period. But to go back to Josephus, which got us on this in the first place, Josephus, the second book, 93, 94, beat at the same time. And I think something happened in here, the mission's time. There were Christians in the imperial household. Well, if you read Eusebius' history of the early church, he says it directly. But what's the best? I mean, talking about the imperial household of um, Nero, and Nero's wife was interested in religious uh, things, Josephus tells us. Um, her name was Papea. And she met Josephus. She liked Josephus. According to Josephus, he got involved with her through a Jewish actor in Rome. And, you know, Nero liked to be on the stage. Josephus says in his Vita that she liked him and sent him away with many gifts. So this starts in Nero's time. People in the household of, of the emperor. Christians in the household of the emperor. Now, whether she's a Christian or a Jewish sympathizer isn't clear. Depending on what you think Christianity is at this point. I'm talking about Pompeia, but she's a sympathizer. Uh, funnily, she gets to know him through a Jewish actor. Uh, Josephus says she sent him away laden with gifts. Now he'd be about 26 years old at that time. He went to Rome on a mysterious vision, a, a visit of some kind that he discusses in his vita to rescue two priests who had gone to Rome to appeal to Caesar. Now you know Paul talks about, or at least the book of Acts talks about Paul's famous appeal to Caesar where the Herodian kings say, to Paul in Acts about 25, 26. The scene is Felix, the Roman governor, a very, very brutal person, Drusilla, a Herodian princess, who divorced someone on Simon Magus's advice to marry Felix. How do I know all this stuff? I read my Josephus. It's all in Josephus. Everything is in Josephus. Nobody reads it carefully. No religious people, no secular people. And, uh, you know, I read them about 30 times. So after you read them about 30 times, you get it all in your brain. So Simon Magus, he's in there too? Yeah, he's in there. Makes it possible for Priscilla to divorce her husband, which was against Jewish law. But Josephus tells us she had already left the religion of her ancestors, Judaism. And uh, then she marries the Roman governor, Felix, who's very, very brutal. Uh, at the Dead Sea Scrolls, divorce and uh, polygamy are very big subjects, uh, and them very, uh, very 
aggressively. In any case, uh, you know, Simon Mike is the big evil person for Christian history. And the apostles are supposed to be against him. You see, I don't think they're against him just for the issue of uh, competing over uh, taking money for uh, ministry activity, which is what Acts tries to present the situation between Peter and Simon Magus. I think there must be bigger issues than that. And I think the issues are to be found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. He makes it possible for rulers to divorce. He keeps company with rulers and people like that. I don't think they do. All of us, but they don't. Anyway, I can't picture Jesus uh, making it possible for a ruler, to, a Herodian ruler, to divorce his uh, wife to marry a Roman governor. Uh, it just seems to be outside his ken. At the scene with Paul, there's Drusilla, and then there's Agrippa II. He's another Herodian king, son of Agrippa I, and Bernicia, his sister who Josephus covers in great detail, who also divorced a lot of husbands and so on, and she ended up the mistress of Titus, the destroyer of Jerusalem and the temple. Titus treated her like Caesar a hundred years before had treated Cleopatra. So what's this got to do with anything? This is how you evaluate Paul and show where he was at where his mindset was. Now, the first part of Acts, I'm filling in background for you here still, 1 to 15, which is sort of uh, spotty and hard to follow and full of miracle stories and uh, sketchy, somewhat made up. I think. From Acts 16 somewhere to the end, we have the we document come in. I told you something about the fact there is a we document. And the pseudo-clementines that I've also mentioned, and I've read to you from, are also expressed in the form of we, we did this, we did that, we, we went here, we went there, like a report to somebody. So I think the pseudo-clementines are parallel to the Book of Acts in many ways. They are an anti-Acts from a, a different point of view. A pro-Palestinian, not pro-Pauline. Acts is a pro-Pauline book. Uh, Paul is the hero of Acts. And Paul is introduced to us in Acts. First as an opponent of Christianity, then his vision is, is, is described, then we follow his missionary journeys, and all the other apostles are forgotten. And uh, basically we end up with Paul in Rome under loose house arrest, being visited by everybody who wanted to see him and uh, paying for his own lodging. Not in a terribly serious situation, it would seem, in 62, and then it cuts off. But I always ask the question, why does Acts stop in 62? Didn't they know what happened in 63, 64, 65, 66? Didn't the writers know? Oh, sure. Yeah. Why did they stop? I don't know. Maybe there was something uh, worse. I don't know why they stopped. What happened in 62 they should have included? Any serious? Uh, redactor of the Acts of the Apostles would have would have included the most important event that happened in 62. The death of James, the leader of the church in Jerusalem. No one ever thinks, well, here's what we have. Yeah, but here's what we don't have. Why? Oh, it just happened that way. Did the authors know it? Sure the authors knew it. How could they not know it? It was the most important event that happened in the history of our early church in that year. I'm not saying the most important brand of all in the church, but in that year, certainly. Not Paul being in the loose house arrest in Rome. That's not the, the most, that's an interesting point, but that's not the most important event in 62. Why does Acts just trail off in 62? Well, I think it had reasons. Uh, it underplays James throughout. Books have agendas. The authors have access to Rome. So you always have to think of that. So anyway, the end of Acts, the last part of five chapters, Paul is keeping very congenial company with all these murderous people. One even says, if a little more Paul, and Rupert two says that, and I would be a Christian. These are the people whose palaces the revolutionaries burned down at the beginning of the war against Rome three or four, uh, five or six years later as the enemies of the Jewish people. Why would they, you know, what, what, what was going on here? We can read your Josephus. 
And then Bernice is accused of incest with her brother, Agrippa II. And actually does come in on his arm as, you know, so quasi consort of some kind. Uh, is she having incest with her brother? We don't know. But anyway, later on then, Titus, the son of Vespasian, who continues the, uh, the siege of Jerusalem in 68-69 after his father goes back to fight for the emperorship in Rome, after Nero's assassinated in 68, and Vespasian emerges the winner, Titus continues the, the, uh, the siege of Jerusalem and then finally destroys the temple and so on and so forth with advice from people like Bernice and her brother who are in his entourage. Why wouldn't they save the temple? Oh, because they'd been barred from the temple and they were very angry. Their great, their great grandfather Herod had built the temple or rebuilt it in its present form and it had only been finished a few years before but they were happy to see it go. They saw it as the hotbed of revolutionary activity in, uh, in, in Palestine in this period. So the picture of Jesus throwing out the money lenders from the uh, temple in the Gospels, uh, I think, is a, a revolutionary act in that context. You know, there's this disturbance, this insurgency activity in the temple. Gospel of Mark says he stopped traffic in the temple for a whole day. Well, what do you mean? How could he, how could he stop traffic? Nobody could come and go. Well, he had to have an entourage powerful enough to uh, do that. That would be an attack on the temple in some way. An attack on the impurity of the temple. Uh, uh, John says, uh, zeal for my father's house consumes me. Portrays Jesus as a kind of zealot. Zeal is the key phrase for zealot. Okay, so um, I was talking about Christians in the, in, in the imperial household. So I said where, uh, I said about uh, Josephus and so on, so we got on all those topics. But uh, Josephus met Pape. Pape, he says, was interested in religious causes. After he left, he going one way with gifts, she says she treated him very well. What, what year would this be about? He was born in, in 38, so 26, then about 64, yeah, 64, right before the war against Rome, yeah, that, that's more like it, 63, 64, somewhere in there. Anyway, Pape is apparently pregnant at some point right after that. I mean, you could even say that uh, Josephus had something to do with that. He seems quite pleased with himself. I think he definitely entered Roman service at that point. He made the context of Rome to enter Roman service. Uh, but anyway, I mean, because he does, though he's commander in Galilee, when he gets back, he very quickly knows people in the Roman camp who know him and whom he knows, so that when he decides not to commit suicide and draws the short straw and kills the others and then surrenders and proclaims Vespasian the Messiah, pretty quick activity, right? First he meets uh, Pape, and then he proclaims Vespasian Messiah, all kinds of interesting things. You see, this is a really interesting character. He'd already laid the contacts, uh, the groundwork for those contacts in his trip to Rome, I believe. He met a lot of interesting, important people. Okay, what about these uh, Christians in the imperial household? Well, let's look at Paul here. Look at Philippians a minute. Paul is uh, going on to writing uh, people at Philippi in Greece. Talks in 11 about the fruits of righteousness, Jesus Christ, living in Jesus Christ, and so on. Salvation for Christ's sake, that's chapter 1. And he suddenly mentions in line 24 of chapter 2. So I hope to send him at once whenever I've seen how things go with me. But I trust in the Lord I also shall come shortly to, to Philippi, talking about Timothy and others going there. Yet I thought it needful to send you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow uh, worker and soldier. Use soldier imagery here. But for you, my your messenger, but the actual word, if you look at the Greek, there is apostolon. So Epaphroditus is his apostle. And the minister to my need. 
So this Epaphroditus is, is really important in this letter. In chapter 3, look out for dogs. Scurrilous uh, allusion there about dogs. Anyway, it goes on about being circumcised on the eighth day of the race of Israel. You see, he never mentions Jew here. He never mentions Judah, the tribe of Judah. He's a race of Israel, a tribe of Benjamin. There are no Benjaminites left at this time. What does he mean by the tribe of Benjamin? Why is he of the tribe of Benjamin? What's he implying there? How does he see himself? Well, who was the famous person in Jewish history who was of the tribe of Benjamin? That made the 1100 years ago. Jonathan. Jonathan and Jenna. And who else? Who's Jonathan's father? Saul. Saul. And what's Paul's name? Saul's. Saul. Does he call himself of the tribe of Benjamin because he knows Saul was of the tribe of Benjamin? Is that why he's calling himself? I, Saul, of the tribe of Benjamin? Or is there really a tribe of Benjamin around at this time? Well, uh, the Jews were using Benjamin to uh, allude to converts often. And the Herodian family would have considered itself of the Benjamin tribe, as I go into very clearly in my book uh, why that is. Uh, Hebrew of the Hebrews. Anyway, I don't want to go too deep of that. What is, um, you see, the Herodians were considered to be Edomites. What's the genealogy of the Edomites? Um, the genealogy of the Edomites, uh, they're from Esau. Who's Esau, son of? He's the son of Isaac, rather, the brother of Jacob. And also, therefore, a descendant of Abraham. If you consider Abraham's descendants Hebrews, then he could easily consider himself as the rather the, uh, the the Herodians could easily be making claims to being a Hebrew of the Hebrews. If you look at the ancient genealogies, but forget all of that. And he ends up in chapter four. I can do all things through Christ, line thirteen, who strengthens me. But you, having fellowship with me in troubles, you know Philippians. That, that's in Macedonia, northern Greece. You no know, church shared me as to going and receiving, but you only. Uh, because even in Thessalonica, you sent both once and again and for my need. Now, not that I look for gifts, but I look uh, to the fruit that multiplies the account. He likes a little fundraising here and there. But I have all things, and more than enough. And I am full, receiving from, and now he mentions Epaphroditus a second time. Epaphroditus, the things... From, your, from you, an odor of sweet smell, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Greet every saint of Christ Jesus, the brothers with me, greet you. All the saints greet you, and especially those in the household of Caesar. There. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. So, um, and it says, to the Philippians, written from Rome by Epaphroditus. That's the ending in the actual Greek. Well, uh, the point is that he sends Epaphroditus to the saints in the household uh, of Caesar. Now, when, uh, this would be somewhere in the mid-50s, perhaps, also. Would well, you know who Josephus dedicates all his work to? The person who, in fact, uh, sponsored all his writings in the household of Caesar? It's Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus is Josephus, and by this time, Epaphroditus is Nero's secretary for Greek letters. And ultimately, Epaphroditus is involved in the assassination of Nero. Epaphroditus, uh, Josephus describes Epaphroditus, and I, I think this is the link between Josephus and Paul. These are the same two individuals. I'm giving you really intimate stuff here that most people will never dig out. Epaphroditus, as you see, is a really intimate colleague, Paul's closest uh, associate in some ways. He calls him his fellow soldier and worker. Uh, Josephus says Epaphroditus had a very uh, 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 exciting career, uh, did many things, was uh, you know, uh, a very interesting person, standout person, uh, had uh, you know, a very uh, rich background of some kind, but he uh, doesn't go into it, but he does praise him in the Vita and in other parts of the Antiquities as his, the person sponsored all of his works and for whom he wrote his works. Now, Epaphroditus is executed, finally, in Domitian's time, as a secret Christian. 
as a secret Christian. The mission was executing by that time in the 90s as a secret Christian. I think just if Epaphroditus was executed, but actually the excuse the mission uses, which is absurd, all the Roman historians tell you, is that he um, raised his hand against an emperor. That is, supposedly he helped Nero commit suicide by holding the sword that, uh, that when Nero was being run after by his Praetorian guard, that Nero ran on his sword, supposedly that Epaphroditus held for him or something like that. So, I mean, even though he supposedly did it at Nero's request uh, to escape the other people who were going to kill him, again, it's all right. Aren't you following me? <laughs> it's the gossip of the period. But it's a really interesting. Anyway, so the charge against Epaphroditus by Domitian is that he raised his hand against the emperor. But for 20 years, uh, Domitian didn't seem to mind. This was just a, a, a cooked up charge to get rid of him. But it seems that this, because Epaphroditus was a secret Christian, at the same time, uh, Domitian executed people in his own family who were secret Christians. The people who actually were supposed to succeed him. A fellow called, see this is the Flavian family. So this is Flavius Clements. In other language, Clement. Now who is the character that the Pseudo-Clementines are written in the name of? The Adventures of Clement. And the Pseudo-Clementines tell you that Clement is very early converted to Christianity and is of a very noble Roman family, a very high-born noble family. Clement also, according to Eusebius and others, is either the first or third pope in Rome, successor to Peter. Finally, there's a woman called Flavia Domitilla. That means she's a female Flavian. She's either the wife, niece, or daughter of Clement, Flavius Clement. I think she's the wife, but we don't know exactly, it's not clear to maybe the needs. Anyway, at the time that Domitian is executing all these people in the 90s, she's uh, uh, exiled or executed, I'm not sure which, to an island someplace. In any case, if you know, if you go to Rome today, the most famous and biggest Christian catacomb in Rome is the Domitilla Catacomb. Because it's named after Flavia Domitilla, because it was founded on her property, because she was a Christian. And Stephen, finally, here we go, the one who assassinated Domitian, I think, in vengeance for all these things, was one of her servants, was one of her slaves. All this has to do with when was Josephus executed or did he die a natural death? I think he was swept up in all these things. He wouldn't have survived, in my view, Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus was his sponsor, his basically uh, sugar daddy, patron, and so on. If, Epa if Epaphroditus was assassinated for pro-Christian leanings or being a secret Christian, Josephus would have been executed too. And he's very worried in the Vita, which is written around 93, 94. He is defending himself against charges of disloyalty to Rome in the in the Vita. He tried to show that his activities on behalf of the rebels and surgeons in Palestine 20 years or 30 years before were, were not serious things that he always supported Rome, etc., 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 etc. And he's bragging about what a big supporter of Rome he is and so on. So, and against some books that are being written that say that he's a, you know, double agent or whatever you want to call it. And, and, uh, I don't know if that interests you. I hope it does. Let's quickly then look at the that, that really fills in a lot of history, by the way. This preface of the Jewish war. The war of the Jews against the Romans, preface to the Jewish war written by Josephus, was the greatest of our time, greater too perhaps than any recorded struggle. Now that is just a bunch of bull. <laughs> I mean, you know, who is he aggrandizing there? The Flavians. Why? This is the Jewish war being written to honor Titus and Vespasian's exploits in conquering the Jews and destroying the temple. That's the singular service he provided for the Flavian family, which is why he got the name Flavius Josephus. Just like these others, Flavia Domitilla, uh, 
I, I, I'm sure that the Clemens in the, in the pseudo-Clementines is supposed to be this Clement, I, that, that this lady is Clemens' character at the younger age. Look at this and take it into your mind seriously, because Josephus is a liar, but he's accusing everyone else of being a liar too. He's not a total liar. He's only a liar where important things go. Yet persons with no first-hand knowledge, accepting baseless and inconsistent story on hearsay, have written garbled accounts of it, while those of eyewitnesses have been falsified, either to flatter the Romans or to vilify the Jews. Now here he wants to show that he, first he honors his own people, and he wants to show not to vilify them, because he's proud of his Jewish background, but he also wants to make them as brave as he can so that the victory looks bigger than it might have been. But here it's interesting. Even Josephus says that at this time, there are accounts circulating that are inconsistent, hearsay, false, garbled, lying accounts, and eyewitnesses, Gospels are supposed to be eyewitness accounts, don't forget, have been falsified, either to flatter the Romans or vilify the Jews. Now you watch the literature we're dealing with, the Gospel literature, and you see if there's any indication of flattering the Romans and vilifying the Jews in that's what he says the defect of historical writing in his period is. He says he's not going to suffer from that, but even he can't avoid it. So that's an important, I mean, I just read the preface just for that one thing, so people realize that even in 74 AD or so around that time, whenever he wrote this preface, Josephus is saying there's maternal circulate and probably can't do anything but do this if it wants to circulate that flatters the Rome that have been falsified, uh, and eyewitnesses accounts the same to flatter the Romans and falsify the Jews. Is that a, a surprising thing? No. If literature is going to survive in this period, with the police state that you're dealing with, probably it would have to do that if it was going to survive. And that's why we have to be very careful about what we read that has survived from this period in the West, Roman area, civilization area. Now, in the East, we have the Dead Sea Scrolls. That was put in caves in this uh, period and was hidden. So it is an example of literature that did not go through the editorial process of the Roman Empire. So therefore, it is not full of flattery, and it is not vilifying Jews at all, the opposite. And it hates groups like the Romans. And uh, we're fortunate to have it. And finally, it says, eulogy or abuse being substituted for factual record. So for the benefit of the emperor's subjects, I have decided to translate into Greek the books which I wrote some time ago. And Okay, so you're right. This copy of Josephus is probably a later copy here because he wrote the other one some time back. Who knows when, he, when this preface is written. Could be 78, 79, like you're saying. You know, because we don't know uh, the earlier one. He said he wrote an earlier version uh, in my native language, which is either Hebrew or Aramaic. I'm not sure which. For circulation in the Middle East, Look at how modern this sounds. I myself, Josephus, son of Matthias, am a Hebrew by race, a priest from Jerusalem. In the early stages I fought against the Romans, and in later events I was an unwilling eyewitness. So he was a prisoner, and he was an eyewitness, so his account is also an eyewitness account. But he's saying it's not falsified, and it's not full of flattery, but he goes on to flatter the Romans totally. The people, as I said, was the greatest of all time. When it occurred, Rome herself was in the most unsettled state. Jewish revolutionaries took advantage of the general disturbance. They had vast resources of men and money. Now, how do they have vast resources of men and money? Well, I think they were supported by the Eastern Persians and others who were undermining Rome against the Roman Empire. He says they had vast resources of men. men we know why they had money. It's, it's, it, it, it's not clear. And so widespread was the ferment that some were filled with hope of gain, others fear of loss by the state of affairs in the East. You see, this is the East. And he writes this for the Jews in the East, who obviously supported this. For the Jews expected all their, that's where the money's coming from, Mesopotamian brethren to join their insurrection. So he's talking about that Iraq, Mesopotamia. And I think in particular in northern Iraq, in my book, I, there is a conversion that takes place in a, in a northern Iraq area called Adiabini. There's a queen that's very honored. Her name is Queen Helen of Adiabini. She converts to something in this period. 
And she sends her emissaries to Jerusalem in the 40s to, um, to um, relieve famine. She has a lot of money. She sends her treasury agents there. In the book of Acts, Paul goes up to Jerusalem in the, in the, in the 40s sometime to bring uh, contributions for famine relief, he says. I believe Paul is among uh, Queen Helen's emissaries to Jerusalem in this period to uh, bring the famine relief. I have a whole chapter, book 20 of the Antiquities. It gives you the whole story of Queen Helen, her famine relief, and so on. And it's followed by certain revolutionary activities in the early and mid-40s that are very, very important for this, uh, for this period. So he says, uh, you know, something's going on. Uh, from another side, Roman supremacy was being challenged by the Gauls and the Celts in England and et cetera. And in fact, after Nero's death, disorder reigned everywhere. There was civil war and so on. Presented with this opportunity, many aspired to the imperial throne while the soldiery were eager for a transference of power as a means of enriching themselves. I therefore thought it inexcusable when such issues were involved to see the truth myths represented and to take no notes. Parthians, Babylonians, remotest Arabians, Babylonian Jews, Assyrians, thanks to my labors, were actually informed of the causes of the war, the sufferings it involved in its disastrous ending. The reason is to teach them, don't mess with Rome. Don't mess with Rome. So first it wrote it to dissuade others in the East. Were the Greeks and those Romans to depart in it, remain ignorant of the facts, deluded with flattery or fiction? Yet the writers I have in mind claim to be writing history, though besides getting all their facts wrong, they seem to me to miss the target altogether. See how modern this is? Of course, it's translated to modern language, but this is like a modern preface of a modern writer. The Romans were very far advanced in terms of writing at that time. I don't think you get writing like this till the 1700s. For they wish to establish the greatness of the Romans who are at all times disparaging and deriding the actions of the Jews. But I do not see how men can prove themselves great by overcoming feeble opponents. That's the point. Again, they're not impressed by the length of the war, the vastness of the Roman forces, which endured such hardships, the genius of the Roman commanders. If the difficulties they overcame are belittled. However, it is not my intention to counter the champions of the Romans by exaggerating the heroism of my own countrymen. I will state the facts accurately and impartially. Well, not quite. At the same time, the language in which I record events will reflect my own feelings and emotions. Now, this is another important point. For I must permit myself to bewail my country's tragedy. She was destroyed by internal dissension, and the Romans, who so unwillingly set fire to the temple. See, he says the Romans didn't want to burn down the temple. They did it unwillingly, because that would be a charge of sacrilege. You know? Were brought in by the Jews' self-appointed leaders, as Titus Caesar, the temple's destroyer, has testified. For throughout the war he pitted the common people, Titus Caesar, his hero, who were helpless against the partisan forces. And over and over he had laid the capture of the city and blown the siege in the hope that the ringleaders would submit. If anyone criticizes me for accusations I bring against the party chief, the gangs of bandits, let's die. That kind of people who were cru uh, crucified uh, uh, on either side of Jesus. Or for my laments over the misfortunes of my country, must part of my weakness regardless of the rules of historical writing. For it so happened that of all cities under Roman rule, our own reached the highest summit of prosperity and in turn fell to the lowest depths of misery. The misfortunes of all other races since the beginning of history compared to those of the Jews seem to fall as it's still going on. But look at the last point. And for our misfortunes, we have only ourselves to blame. Mia culpa. That goes into the Gospels. His death be on our head and on our descendants, etc., 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 etc. The cry of, we're, we're at fault. Not you, it's us who are, who are at fault. And Josephus start, starts it right there. Why would he humiliate himself so much? I think uh, because uh, to survive in this period, you pretty much have to, uh, how, uh, how then can I master my feelings? If anyone is disposed to pass harsh judgment on my emotion, he must remember the facts belong to the story, and only the grief is the writers. He, he's, he's in grief because the city has been destroyed and the temple has been destroyed. On the other hand, and he goes on with some other things. By the way, he starts the history in the next page, starting with Antiochus Epiphanes, who stormed Jerusalem, holding it for three and a half years. There's the time, two times and a half in Daniel that we were looking for in your class the other, the other day. Uh, we're driven out of the country by the Asmonians, the Maccabeans. I shall explain how the descendants, uh, by their struggles for the throne, forced Pompey. <laughs> it's always, they forced the Romans to intervene. <laughs> the Romans didn't want to intervene. Because of the Jews' dissension that the Romans had. Uh,
intimate. So you never criticize the Roman leadership if you can avoid it. Antipater's son, Antipater was the uh, Arab uh, intermediary who brought the Romans in, uh, brought Sosius and in, and put an end to the Hasmonean dynasty and so on. Uh, so you can go through this whole extra thing, but most, mostly he, like in the last paragraph, I contrast the brutality of the party chiefs towards their countrymen with the clemency of the Romans. <laughs> Read what the Romans did around the Sea of Galilee after they took it, if you want to. They put all the, uh, all the old men and uh, 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 infirm and uh, babies and others to the sword while they took all the rest of the people into slavery, the women and the able-bodied men. And they divided up the spoils between Vespasian, Agrippa II, the king we were talking about, and others. Just read the, his account of the fall of the cities around in the Sea of Galilee. This, this supposed clemency and so on. And read the fun and games that he talks about after the fall of Jerusalem when Titus had birthday celebrations for his brother all up and down the Mediterranean coast at stadiums and uses all the Jewish captives. Anyway, at the end he says, all this I have embraced in seven books. To those who took part in the war or have ascertained the facts as I left no ground for complaint or criticism. It's for those who love truth, not people who just want to be entertained that I have written. I will now begin my story where I begin my summary. Anyway, so he says it's for those who love truth. His, his writing is for those who love truth. Well, comparatively speaking, it may be, may be it was. Let me just uh, read you another uh, bit from Josephus, a part about the different parties in the antiquities when he's talking about the um, zealots. After the tax, he gives the different sex here, yeah, book 18. He gives two discussions of the sex of Judaism. One is in book 18 of the Antiquities. The longer one where he talks about the Essenes is, um, I think, um, at the beginning of book two of the war. But he talks about the death. This all happens in the death of, a time of the death of, um, of uh, Herod in 4 BC. And uh, the reason I'm doing this is because Jesus is supposed to be born. According to Matthew, Jesus is born in 4 BC. According to Luke, he's born at the time of the census, which would be 6 to 7 AD, when the Romans took direct control of Palestine, Judea, because they were fed up with the uh, Herodian governors or kings or petty kings, whatever you want to call them, because they couldn't control the situation. So he says here, um, now, Cyrenius, a Roman senator, this is in Book 18, Chapter 1 of the, of the Antiquities, um, had gone through, uh, one who had gone through other magistrates, passed through them until they had been consul and so on, came at that time into Syria with a few others, being sent by Caesar, meaning Augustus, to be a judge, and take an account of their substance. That's where they get the... The, the census under Cyrenius or Quirinius. Um, moreover, Cyrenius came himself to, to Judea, which was now added to the province of Syria, because they took the, this is 6 to 7 AD, to take an account of their substance and dispose of Archelaus, the last Herodian descendant there, before some later ones come back in. But the Jews, although at the beginning took the report of taxation very badly, yet did they leave off any further opposition to it by the persuasion of one Yoazer, who was the son of one called Boethus, the high priest. So this the high priest, who the Herodians, who the Herodians appointed. The reason that Yoazer and Boethus were high priests is Herod married the daughter of one of these Boethus, a second Miriam that he imported from Egypt after he killed the first Miriam, who was a Maccabean, who was his first wife. And he had two wives called Miriam or Miriam or Mary. And the second one was an Egyptian, uh, a, a daughter of an Egyptian Jewish high priestly family that was more accommodating. So her uh, family member, this person called Yoazer, and there was, a, uh, as on one side of the dispute, there was another called Judas the Golanite of the city by that name, uh, he, which was Gamal, who taking with him one Sadduk, a Pharisee, became zealous, zealous, to draw the people to revolt and said, 
that this taxation was no better than the introduction of, to, of slavery and exhorted the nation to exert its liberty as if this could procure them happiness and security for what they possessed and an assured enjoyment of still greater good which was that of the honor and glory they would acquire uh, through this, uh, through their, if you want, their sacrifice, their martyrdom, if you want. They also said that God would not otherwise be assisting them upon their joining with another in such councils as might be successful, etc., 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 etc. What he's saying here is that um, Judas and Saduk, in war he only mentioned Judas, draw the people away on the tax issue. And that the establishment priests support the tax issue. Well, the tax issue is the basis of Jesus' birth moment in the Gospel of Luke. And Jesus is presented over and over again with a tax issue. So you see, this is all connected and a very burning issue. But to know this, who you have to read? Unfortunately, to see. So I'm picking these little points out for you. For Judas and Saduke, who excited a fourth philosophical sect among us, and had great many followers therein, filled our civil government with tumults, at present, and laid the foundations of our future miseries. The one he says, and we have only ourselves to blame in the war. By this system of philosophy, he calls it a system of philosophy, which we were before unacquainted with, we didn't know about before, concerning which I shall discourse a little. And this rather because the infection, the disease, Paul in the book of Acts is considered a disease carrier. Are you a disease carrier? The infection which spread thence among the younger people who were zealous for it, brought our country to destruction. So this all began, you see, not in 66. According to Josephus, this began when? In the period 4 to 7 AD, with the death of Herod and the, and the unrest that followed it, the coming of the Romans uh, to direct control in Palestine, and then um, the insurrectionary movements that developed as a result of that, particularly as a result of the taxation. And uh, this grew and grew and grew over 70 years. Don't forget, 70 is an important number in Daniel. Until the final outbreak of the war. At that point, he says, for the Jews had uh, for a while three sects of philosophy. The Essenes, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees. I have already spoken of this in the second book of the Jewish War. Yeah, I said he goes into much more detail. But interestingly enough, he doesn't tell you anything about the Zealots, the fourth group, Judas and Zadok's group, at that point. He only tells you about the Essenes in great detail. But in this, you can read this yourself, but in this description in the Antiquities, uh, maybe a decade or two later, he cuts a little bit away from the description of the Essenes in the war and adds it to the description of the, of the, of the Zealots in the Antiquities. But of the fourth sect of Jewish philosophy, Judas the Galilean, that is this Judas the Golanite. Why does he call Judas the Golanite earlier? Where is Gaul? The area above the Sea of Galilee. The main city of the Golanites was this town called Gamala. Josephus talks about it in his Jewish war and how he was supposed to defend it. Why was it called Gamala? Because in Arabic and Hebrew, Gamal is what word? Camel. Gamal. Gamal. Gamala. The reason it's called Gamala is because it's on a ridge that looks like the hump of a camel. He says Judas the Zealot, or Judas the Golanite, came from, or Judas the Galilean. We see, he's not a Galilean because he doesn't come from Galilee. He comes from Gamala in the Golan. It's next door to Galilee, but it's not Galilee. So it looks like Galilean is also the name of the fourth sect. And the church fathers do have Galileans as another name for Zealots. And interestingly enough, Jesus' followers are always being asked, are you Galileans? You know, Peter standing by the fire outside the uh, high priest's house when Jesus is being condemned, and he says, are you a Galilean? And he says, no, 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 no. Uh, the fourth sect was founded by Judas the Galilean. That, I think, means he, he, the Galilean means he's, he's uh, a member of the Galilean party. These men agree in all other things with the Pharisee notions, but they have an inviolable attachment to liberty. That's the difference between them and the Pharisees. The Pharisees are willing to live under foreign rule. And they say that God is to be their only ruler. Only God rules here. So when Jesus gets the coin, what happens? He says, uh, show me the coin. Whose picture is on the coin? They say Caesar. So he says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar and God's what is God's. 
But what isn't said there is for the Zealot, nothing is Caesar in Palestine. Everything is God. God rules here, not Caesar. See, he said here, they have an inviolable attachment to liberty, and they say that God is their only ruler or lord. So you could say that Jesus is also saying nothing goes to Caesar. They also do not buy you any kind of debt, nor indeed do they heed the deaths of their relations and friends. Nor can any such uh, fear make them call any man lord? Nobody is lord. No man is lord. Therefore, in the Gospels, calling Jesus lord would be outlawed by these people. They will not call any man Lord. You have to read these things really. And since this immovable resolution of theirs is well known to a great many, I shall speak no further about that matter, because he was an interrogator prisoner, he knew all about their immovable resolution. Nor am I afraid that anything I have said about them should be disbelieved, but rather fear that what I have said it is beneath the resolution they show when they undergo torture. And it was in Gaseus Flores' time in the 60s that the nation began to grow wild with this distemper. And he was our procurator, and he occasioned the Jews to go wild, uh, making by the abuse of his authority to make them revolt against the Romans. And these are the second philosophy. So look, he mentions lots of things there, but mainly says that the Roman governors goaded the Jews into revolt against Rome. But these extreme Jews didn't mind dying death of any kind, and they would call no man Lord. Who do they, who do they resemble in Christianity? They're the first martyrs. They don't mind undergoing any torture. And they prefer death to, uh, you know, any kind of betrayal or so on and so forth. Okay, sorry, let you go.